we are live on Facebook and coming very up very quickly. We are live on YouTube. There we go. Start streaming. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Start off by talking about a, a conversation I had today. Um, this woman flew. Um, this was back when I was in Detroit. I'm now in Arizona. For those of you who don't know, my weight loss surgeon practicing in um, in in Tucson, Arizona, right now, where the weather's pretty amazing, uh, and I'm I'm really happy here. Um, and we got a great practice and, and um, staying pretty busy and, and, and excited about being here. Um, so I talked to a patient of mine who had flown to see me um, in Detroit and um, was really uh, doing amazingly well. She was at her goal weight, uh, she was eating super clean, following the Pound of Cure program. She was actually so happy she wrote a book about her experience on bariatric surgery. And um, hi, Julie. How are you? Good to see you, Robert. We got some questions pouring in, so I'm gonna just, uh, just kind of uh, finish this story. So she's writing a book about how bariatric surgery needs to be a mainstream option, and how patients have been treated for decades with shame and and made to feel guilty about their disease, when in reality this is really a metabolic disease, and it's an it's a result. Seeking treatment for diabetes, and I think it's time for us to stop seeking, uh, criticizing people for seeking treatment for their obesity. Weight loss surgery. Um, so, with that being said, let's get to some of the questions right here. Uh, so, Julia wants to know what to eat at seven weeks. So, it's seven weeks out from surgery. And um, making sure you get anywhere very minimum of 50 grams, but ideally 80 grams of protein in. Ideally, your fluid intake should be fairly routine, and you should be able to do that without too much difficulty. Um, but at, at seven weeks, you should be staying comfortable. You should be avoiding vomiting. You really shouldn't be vomiting at all at this stage in the game. And it should be all about kind of working on developing your relationship with food and focus on eating mindfully where you're really chewing slowly and are, um, are, are tasting the food, asking yourself, how does this food make you feel? And when you start to, to learn that skill, that's something you can carry with you for the rest of your life. Um, so I think what should you be eating? You should be eating foods that are high in protein not forgetting about the fact that beans and nuts, which are, are non-animal sources of protein, have a lot of protein and are typically much easier to eat at this stage, um, and focusing on eating mindfully. Uh, Abigail, what health benefits regarding more energy um, to be expected for someone with a BMI of 35 to 39? How much is quality of life is improved from weight loss? Well, that is a question I can't answer for you. So you're, you're you know, let's, Let's look at this group of kind of low BMI patients. And I'll do um, typically sleeves on patients even in the BMI of 30 to 35 range. And I've been super, have to pay for it out of their pocket because insurance won't cover it in that. In it's, it's really a great option for those patients. They can lose 40, 50 pounds, get to you know their high school weight or their, a, a fantastic weight. So, in the BMI range of 35 to 39, it really depends on your medical conditions. Do you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes? If you have none of those, then, then quite often we're typically talking about quality of life. And there's two sides to the quality of life. There's physical comfort and then there's the emotional side of things. And the physical comfort, if, if your weight makes you feel uncomfortable, um, then you're gonna generally get a lot of benefit from the surgery. Uh, the emotional side is much more complicated, and when patients, especially in this low BMI group, when I talk to them, I really doing the surgery for themselves and not for someone else. And if you feel like you're doing the surgery to get someone to like you more or to get your your professional or job situation better, you 
then in general, you, you're probably not going to be as happy or as emotionally satisfied after the surgery as you think you will. you got to do these surgeries for yourself to make your life better so that you feel better as opposed to doing it so that someone else will feel differently about you. You really can't control how other people feel about you. You can just control how you react and what you do um, uh, to in, in, in your own world. And let everybody else do what they do and, and let that work out. So Robert Simpson, I heard that, I'm going to bring this up a different way because it's a little tricky to, to read this way. All right, so I heard, I've heard that the gastric bypass is no longer considered the gold standard. Is that true? I heard it's a sleeve now. So, you know, the gold standard is a very vague term. The gold standard means the best weight loss, the best results. I think we still all do consider the gold standard because you lose more weight from a gastric bypass and you have better durability from the gastric bypass. And the complication rate the gastric bypass is still very, very good. However, more sleeves are done in this country than gastric bypasses, for sure, almost two to one. And there are a lot of surgeons out there who really only exclusively provide sleeve gastrectomies. And to me, I think that's doing your patients a disservice because there are two very good surgeries. Uh, and I kind of joke, I have two children and I love them both equally, but in very different ways. And I have two weight loss surgeries that I perform with frequency, a gastric bypass and a sleeve gastrectomy, and I love them both in, in very different ways. And so, I, you know, gold standard to me is a vague term. The question, Robert, is what's right for you? And what surgery is the best one for you? For those of you um, who haven't seen my um, poundofcureweightloss.com website, I've got probably 75 free videos on there, including one um, co entire course on for anyone preparing for weight loss surgery, um, and and um, this is would be something that would be helpful for you to pick out the right surgery for you. All right, so Nelly Jumper, I had a sleeve gastrectomy on September 10th, 2018, so that puts you about uh, seven, eight months out. Uh, you can eat a little bit more than in the beginning of my surgery. Is this normal? Yes, Nelly, it'd be normal if you if you didn't. Over time, you're able to eat more and more and more over, you know, with each passing month. And this can go on for two, three, four, even five years out from surgery. And there's different stages of weight loss surgery. There's the initial recovery stage, then there's the honeymoon stage. Then there's what I call the end of the honeymoon stage, where you realize this surgery is not going to do all the work for you, and you're going to have to really dig your heels in and start making those lifestyle changes. Um, and, and exercising and, and eating and doing all the things that you promised you promise yourself. And then finally, there's dealing with weight regain, which is part of the deal. You know, everybody who's had the surgery is going to struggle with some amount of weight regain. You are not going to reach your bottom weight and not gain five pounds at some point in your life. That is just a false notion and you should get it out of your mind if you're planning a surgery. What do when you gain those five pounds? How are you going to adjust what you're doing? How are you going to eat? How are you going to strategize? How are you going to prevent yourself from gaining any more, whether it's a medication or sugar-sweetened beverages or some other cause of this weight gain? What are you going to do? So, so Nelly, this is just the beginning for you. And I'm not saying this to scare you. You should welcome this because it's an opportunity for you to eat more fruits and vegetables and more of the healthy food that's going to nourish you. Um, and, and, Expect that this is going to happen and, and also really don't fall victim to my portion, what I call the portion control trap. That idea is that at seven months you'd say, well, you know, yeah, I'm eating pizza again. Pizza was always my weakness. But listen, I used to eat four pieces of pizza. Now I'm eating like half of a small piece. So I'm fine. And then when I touch base with you at a year out, that small half of a small piece is now almost a whole small piece. And then at 18 months, it's, you know, that small piece goes down and you're still kind of looking around for food and so on and so on. And eventually you're eating three and four. So it's not about eating less. It's about eating better. Um, all right. Miss Kayla Page. Dr. Wine, you helped change my life down 124 pounds two years out. Good to see you, Kayla. 
Congrats, that's awesome. 124 pounds is a lot of weight. Morelia Charlotte saying, I'm wondering what is considered grazing two years after the sleeve. I know that's, that snacking is to be avoided because it can increase weight gain. How can post-surgery people balance small meals? So snacking, eating between meals is often vilified. And the reason it's vilified is because of what Americans consider snack food. So most snack food, we think of the 100 calorie snack packs, it's cheese and crackers, chips, it's pretzels, it's crap. It's calorie rich um, processed food. And snacking or eating that type of food on carrots and celery. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and if you choose, you can eat them frequently and eat them until you feel full and satisfied. If your goal is to master hunger and prevent it from coming, uh, you're gonna fail at that. Your goal has to be to eat as much healthy food that will nourish your body and keep it running at its optimal state so that the weight drops down. So snack all you like, Morelia, but snack on super healthy food. Uh, we've got a plasma, to, May 11, I donate plasma regularly. Will this cause me to be deferred from bariatric surgery? No. And plasma typically isn't going to remove any red blood cells. So if you donate blood regularly, a gastric bypass surgery, which can impede your iron absorption, can be a little problematic in that setting. And so I'd be a little careful with that um, because it's it's not the best, um, it's not the best uh, uh, cho surgery choice for someone who wants to continue to give blood regularly. If you're just giving plasma, I think, you know, you should be encouraged to do that. Donating plasma um, is, is um, a great thing to do. You can save a lot of lives and we need more blood products out there. So um, go ahead and do it. I wouldn't worry about that in impacting your surgery. Um, so Sarah Conklin wants to know, does Medicare pay for surgery in Illinois? Yes, but keep in mind, Medicare only pays 80%. So there's always that 20% that's left over. A lot of times um, the secondary will cover it, um, but you may be on the hook for a couple of bucks. But typically Medicare patients have no problem getting this and, and I found have the lowest cost of their total um, procedure. So Abigail, arthritis, it's a question. Well. I'm going to interpret that as, will this surgery help my arthritis? And the answer is yes, a little bit, but that's my typical experience, is it definitely gets better. You're moving with less weight, so there's less pressure on the joints, but the idea that you're going to be able to walk pain-free um, is really not how it's most likely going to work out. I think I, I often look at this in patients with really severe arthritis is these surgeries are a bridge to joint replacement. So if you've been told you need a joint replacement but you're too heavy, a bariatric surgery is a great way to get that weight down and then you have a much better mobility after you get your joint replacement and a much lower complication rate too. Um, so Morelia, are dates considered fruits on the pound of cure? Yes, they are. Robert Simpson. Does gold standard matter if both are good surgeries? Which one works better for you? Bypass to a leaner Lynn? Good to see you again, leaner Lynn. I agree completely. Um, Pat, Patty Kinney, hello. Wondering what you think about adding collagen to set point smoothie as a source of protein. Fantastic question. Um, so collagen is one type of protein. It's found typically in joints. Um, and fingers and nails and hair and things like that. So every now and then somebody comes around and says, hey, people like protein. Let me think of some protein that sounds healthy and good. Collagen sounds healthy and good. Who doesn't want it? And well, joints, so everybody's got joint pain. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this collagen, which is usually discarded as part of the animal processing um, um, way that things are, are, are made. And so I can get it for real cheap. I can grind it up, stick it in with some artificial flavors, some artificial sweeteners and sell it for a lot of money. And so I'm going to push this collagen thing. I'm going to hire a couple of people to write some blog articles about how collagen is the protein. But the truth is, Patty, if you are drinking a set point smoothie and you are following the pound and you do not need to supplement. 
eating more protein, especially in animal protein, which collagen is, it comes from animals, plants don't have hair, um, then you don't then then you don't need any more protein. And you definitely don't to see you, Susan, 250 pounds. Holy cow, want to see a Detroit that I work with a lot. Um, one is uh, Tansman, he's fantastic. Uh, the other is Andrew Lofman. Can't go wrong with either one of them. They will treat you very well. Excellent, excellent surgeons, excellent people. Um, those are who I've sent people to. And then there was a woman who just operated on a patient of mine. She did an amazing job. He really was very complicated too. Um, if you call my office uh, and ask, um, they may be able to remember um, who that, that surgeon was. I apologize, I can't. Texas bound girl, hello. Nellie Jumpers lost 85 pounds. That's awesome, Nellie, keep it up. Abigail, does the surgery cause a slower metabolism like a diet would? That's a great opportunity for me to use a little bit of graphics here. It's not showing up all that well. It's a little stretched out, but it'll still work. Um, so, go over um, this. So, this graphic really shows, uh, it's what I call your metabolic thermostat, and it shows how when you starve yourself, your hunger increases and your metabolism decreases. So, if you put yourself on a starvation diet, your hunger will increase and your metabolism will slow down. Anybody who's watching this video, I'm sure has experienced this firsthand. Um, so, weight loss surgery or something that lowers your set point. And then we lower your set points, but your body weight's still right here. So your body weight's high, and your set point is now really low, so you're on this overfed side of the spectrum. And when you're on that overfed side of the spectrum, it occurs is that your hunger decreases and your metabolism increases. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So any attempts at weight loss, whether it's through surgery, through nutrition, through exercise, through medicine, So, weight loss surgery typically does not decrease your metabolism the way a diet. Diet, I'll just lose the weight, but it's different. Starvation diets are very different from weight loss surgery. Now, changing the quality of your diet by following something like my Pound Cure program or a vegan diet um, or something close to a vegan diet, that's a different story. By changing the quality of the food, And that really gets down to this idea that a calorie is not a calorie, which we're starting to see more and more discussion of. And I think it's becoming or 200 calories of salad, that makes a difference. Even though they're both calories, it makes a difference. All right, so um, where are we? This, okay, so L and L and M Beasley Williams. How can I break the? Very common question. I've got a video on YouTube called "How to Drop the Pop." The, that video really talks about what what is the ultimate driver of of soda pop addiction. That's caffeine. There's a lot of caffeine in in pop soda pop. I'm in in Arizona soda and Michigan it's pop soda pop. So there's a lot of caffeine in that and when you, it's almost impossible to break a caffeine habit. I, I am a caffeine addict. I must have coffee every morning and often there's nothing wrong with black coffee. So what, what, um, do is figure out a way to, to get your caffeine in 
that doesn't contain sugar. This can be black tea or chai tea or green tea or black coffee or um, uh, they have caffeinated water. It takes, but somehow get that caffeine in. Once you maintain the caffeine, it's generally not so hard to, to, to drop the pop. It's going to take a few weeks before you start, you lose your cravings, but as long, and as long as you maintain that caffeine, stretch out a gastric sleeve. You know, all gastric sleeves are too. I have a video on your stomach from stretching and The, the bottom line is, is that it's not about the stretching, it's about reverting to old habits. And if you revert to old habits, you eat unhealthily again, and that's when the weight comes back, the food cravings come back, and all your struggles um, start to come back. So no, you really shouldn't worry about, you worry about eating the healthiest way you can, and of course that's gonna mean a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, how much should you eat in a serving two years post-op, please? So, there's a couple of different ways to look. Um, do it. My um, uh, dietitian has something in Japanese, which means eat until you're um, uh, eighty percent full, and I, I think that's a great way of thinking about it. I like the the French way, and I am not really good in French. I kind of stopped in high school. But this means, and I think there might be an E here, I'm not sure. This means I'm full in French. But if you translate it, it means I don't have hunger. And I think that's another great way of thinking about it. You should. Beginning of this, of this um, uh, video so that you're eating slowly, you're asking yourself, how does this piece of food make me feel? And if you eat more, well, whatever amount of food that takes to do that, that's what you should do. And if the hunger returns even too much, you should nourish yourself with super healthy, unprocessed food. Um, and not make this some kind of mathematical formula about the shape of your, your sleeve and how much you should eat in every two hours, every five times a day. Nobody has any answers because there is no answer. And what to is that everybody's an individual. So what works for you won't work for your, your friend who's also had the exact same surgery. Again, you know, if you find yourself eating 15 dates a day, you might want to check yourself or rein yourself in a little bit. But even that, I don't think that's going to cause your set point to go up. It's really just going to cause you to kind of gain a little bit of weight right here where you're going to be living a little bit more on this overfed side of the spectrum. And you'll be five or 10 pounds heavier than you could be if you weren't eating all those dates. But the problem is banana and I really have yet to meet someone who has regained a substantial amount of weight after just isn't what we're struggling with. And so dates help keep you on a program like the Look, um, I've got Julie and Pam, good to see you. Um, Tamara says, how do I reset my pouch? Well, your pouch isn't going to reset. Your pouch just is. There's no really such thing as resetting a pouch. What you can do is reset. And what I would suggest is you get on our metabolic reset diet. It's in my book, A Pound of Cure, or it's on the, the website, www.poundofcureweightloss.com. Um, and that can help turn down cravings and get you on the right track. What, what, you know, it sounds to me like you're looking to kind of get back on track to figure out how to eat better and to really dial your... 
That's the metabolic reset diet, which is a little bit of lean protein and lots and lots of fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, and beans without any dairy, artificial sweeteners, added sugar, junk food, or grains like bread, rice, potatoes. content with meal plans and recipes and everything you need to know to follow that that type of program on the poundofcureweightloss.com um tammy had the sleeve first and then the root metabolic reset diet you lost 136 pounds that's awesome that's amazing I'm guessing you had the revision to a ruin why because you had bad GERD or flux as opposed to poor weight eight pounds um, pre-surgery she's lost 97 wants to lose 40 50 more is that a reasonable goal so many far out you are from surgery so I really oh there you go you're 10 months out from surgery um, what surgery Ivy um, you know for a sleep gastrectomy We'll often see a gastric bypass, maybe a little bit more weight. Um, 45 to 50, is that reasonable? I'm not sure. A little bit more than I think you probably will lose. Um, but I think focusing on the scale is a big mistake. And it's the very best that you can. Exercise the very best that you can. Treat others in your life with respect and kindness and enjoy it and, and not necessarily stress. Focus on the weight that you've lost, not the weight that you haven't. Enjoy all of the, the benefits that 97 pounds and plus is going to bring to your life and what you'll find is that the behaviors that this type of brings is going to put you on the right track way better than getting on the scale every day and getting you didn't lose all the weight you once thought you did or somehow someone told you you should um, is in the office to purchase. We don't have it in the office to purchase yet. We're working on that. You can get it online at Amazon, um, but we should definitely uh, make that happen. I've got, since starting here, I've got a million things to do and kind of figure that. Uh, so Stephanie, they put me on meds and it gets lower. Can I have the surgery? Um, so, this is really an insurance question. Each insurance policy is a little different. Oftentimes, if your BMI drops below 35, you not qualify for the surgery anymore. But if it goes back up, then you're gonna, you can qualify again. Typically, six months of supervised weight loss. Uh, so I'm going to turn back to, um, uh, to YouTube. And I've got uh, some people thanking me. Thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, Abigail, thank you so much for sleeve surgery. That's awesome, Abigail. EGDs are a piece of cake. It's a great nap. Don't be don't stress about that. Hey Danny, good to see you. Um, Texas bound girl. Than you were expecting. Well, Good. I um, sometimes I, I'll do that. Uh, so so we have uh, my name is Annette. I had my sleeve done here in Massachusetts. Almost two hundred pounds lost. Amazing after a sleeve. So great. You're eating plant based. I love it. You can be successful. Based diet after uh, after weight loss surgery. I don't push and promote a fully plant based diet to my patients, just because I recognize I recognize and, and I have a lot of patients who are primarily plant based. You if you do it right, and right means fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and beans enough.
beans and nuts, you can be super healthy, probably the healthiest of anybody after this weight loss surgery. Anybody who tells me that eating a turkey sandwich is healthier than eating a vegan so you can be super healthy, 200 pounds. My book, that makes me so, so happy. I'm probably butchering your name, my nana, my nana Mias. Um, but it really, that's really, uh, that book got you on the right track. And man, what a difference in your life. Uh, do I recommend Stevia from Ellen M. Beasley Williams? No. Tobacco's natural too, that doesn't make it healthy. Secondly, anybody who's ever used stevia knows I've never seen a white powder that exists in nature. I've seen a white powder that you can get by prime. What I see is either flour or sugar. Flour from grinding up and sugar from refining sugar cane or beets or sometimes coconuts. So because you, it starts with a plant and then is refined, doesn't make it natural. You know what makes stevia natural? The marketing team that came up with this idea that stevia is natural. But nonetheless, it does not take away from the fact that stevia has, is a, has a sweet taste without calories. I've got videos on this on both PoundCureWeightLoss.com and on YouTube that talk about how when you fool your taste buds in your mouth and even in your intestine with a sweet taste without any carbohydrate coming behind them. But also a little bit of salt in terms of weight loss is, is all right. Um, and it's not necessarily something that you should try to avoid. What I'd have you do is salt some celery or um, so, uh, salt some cucumbers or some tomatoes. I think that would be a great thing. Uh, Beth Ann, no plans for the WLSFA in Orlando this month. I was there, oh, well, that was probably four years ago. I had a great time. They haven't invited me back. Send out an invitation. Maybe I'll come. I really had a great time, and, and um, it's a great convention. It's a bunch of weight loss surgery patients getting together and sharing um, their success stories and, and sharing their, their tricks and supporting each other. It's kind of like a, like a three it's awesome so I really appreciate what they're doing um, and you know invite me to come back and who knows maybe I will um, Lori Palmer seven months out abdomen hurts most early in the day not diarrhea but loose stools I would like to come off Prilosec to side effects what do I think Laura I think this is a question for you and your surgeon not necessarily something um, that should be addressed on YouTube, I apologize, um, but uh, you know I think we got to draw the line in terms of. I, I generally, if you're having abdominal pain after weight loss surgery, you need to see a weight loss surgeon face to face, not on social media. Or we do medicine, um, and I think actually you can accomplish quite a bit on telemedicine. Um, mild problems, yes. Severe problems, no. Um, Patty Kinney joined Orange Theory Fitness in Gross Point. You talked to my friend Scott Marcus there. Um, yes, he did. He called me up and says, hello, good to see you. Yeah, I, I think Orange Theory is awesome. It's a great form of exercise. It's that higher intensity stuff that really drives a lot of weight loss. Um, Irma Duncan, I'm almost two years from having the gastric sleeve. Can you eat oatmeal or cream of wheat or would that be bad? I haven't bought any or haven't eaten any. Just wondering, would that hurt my pouch? It's not going to hurt your pouch. The question is, is it going to cause weight gain? I think steel cut oats are probably okay, particularly if you exercise a ton. Um, cream of wheat, I'm a little less enthusiastic about because it's a little more um, uh, uh, processed. So, uh, you know, I think if you're going to do anything, do some good you know, old fashioned oats or steel cut oats. I like the overnight oats, maybe with some almond milk and some, some fruit. If you mix that in with a good workout, I don't see any trouble. Kind of uh, these whole grains, these higher fiber, less processed whole grains. In general, they're not terrible foods and I think you can be very successful and eat them with some regularity. But um, 
I'd be careful if you're not. Uh, Brendan Curtis. Is that my old friend Brendan Curtis my from uh, back from Detroit? What are my thoughts on the keto diet for weight um, state? So the keto diet generally says you can eat all of the animal protein you like as long as you eliminate these terrible, awful foods called carbohydrates which encompasses such a huge and vast group of foods like Cheetos, which I agree you shouldn't eat, but also beans, which I don't think you shouldn't eat. I think you should eat tons of beans. They're one of the healthiest foods on the planet. So yes, you should absolutely, um, any diet that vilifies fruit and beans, I don't like. Now, if you say to me, I wanna follow a low animal protein keto diet, but I wanna incorporate beans and fruit into it, I would be very much in favor with that because that's going to be very similar to, to my program. But I think encouraging people to eat large amounts of animal protein is doing them a disservice and is ignoring the fact that a diet high in animal protein increases your risk of diabetes, weight gain, heart disease, dementia, and, and a bunch of other things too, um, just to start. So we have to acknowledge that large amounts of animal protein as part of your diet really is not, it doesn't make any sense. And anybody you know, eat it an entire rack of ribs and then sit back and ask yourself, did you, did I just do something? You feel that you, you haven't. Um, so worth it, Charles. Hi, Dr. Weiner. I'm seven years ruin Y post-op and I've regained most of my weight. I'm so sorry to hear that, Charles. I'll be meeting with my surgeon soon and would like to know what I should be asking my surgeon. Well, you know, a revision for weight gain after a ruin Y, especially 2012 we were generally pretty good at it and, and so you know I break the, this down into normal anatomy weight regain and abnormal anatomy weight regain so you're probably going to need to have some form of evaluation through an upper GI and a, um, uh, a an endoscopy to make sure everything's kind of right but I mean really what I would be looking at with your weight loss surgeon is nutrition exercise and possibly medications um, Sixenda is a really great medication. It's covered by some insurance plans and it's pretty well, well tolerated. It's a daily injection, which is not exactly a, a great way to take a medicine, but it is a really good weight loss medicine. And I think that there's some opportunity to, um, to potentially put that in, but I wouldn't start with that. So I'd ask your surgeon what their thoughts are on Sixenda, um, you know, what, whether they have a back on track program. I think my pound to cure program would be a great way to do it. I have a course on weight loss on the pound to cure weight loss.com uh, website that goes over systematically how to address weight regain after surgery. Um, all right, Ellen, it would be for a duodenal switch patient. So I don't do duodenal switch um, because it's a really rigorous surgery. I think duodenal switch, I would not necessarily put someone on my pound to cure protein diet. I'd have them eating more protein. Um, I don't think you're gonna be able to be healthy on a plant-based diet after a duodenal switch. Duodenal switch is a very severe malabsorptive diet. Um, uh, so it's a uh, malabsorptive surgery. And it can be really, it can be a little bit of a tough lifestyle. So I, um, uh, anyway, so I, I you know, I, I, I don't have a, a, an ideal menu for a day other than you probably need over 100 grams of animal protein and there's probably a handful of vitamins that you're gonna to have to take. Um, all right, bypass to a leaner Lynn. Why do you say grains are not good? Brown rice, quinoa, farro are complex carbs, are slowly digested and don't significantly spike your blood sugar and are generally considered whole foods, I thought. So, so leaner Lynn, you are right on the money. comes down to is a spectrum. So we have nutrition is a spectrum. So this, you know, unhealthy, bad foods for lack of, you know, just because we're doing this quickly. Um, and sugar sweetened beverages sit right at the very end. They're the worst for you. Then we've got junk food. That's, they kind of go together. Um, and then we have animal protein. And then I think right here is where the grains sit and we've got whole grains like what you're talking about 
and especially things like, you know, steel cut oats, like I mentioned earlier. They're not terrible. And I think if you use them strategically in small amounts, particularly if you exercise a lot, you're going to be able to tolerate um, very well. Uh, now you start getting into the processed grains. I'm sorry, processed grains would be, would be and then you start getting into beans and nuts and fruits and vegetables over here. So, you know, you're just kind of starting to migrate and, and we do allow a little bit of brown rice, it's totally toxic. Because what I really want you to avoid are sugar sweetened beverages and refined sugar and fat, fast food and junk food and to avoid. So I think it's really, you know, if, if you look through my stuff, I never really um, am too harsh on those types of foods because I think there's some room and I even do have it talks about how to add some flexibility into your diet so that it's sustainable. And I talk exactly about adding these types of foods in. So um, I, I, I think that there's definitely a role for them. And you're right, I, I don't, don't, don't get, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm you that they're a terrible food that you should avoid at all costs. Um, all right, Tara Mendoza. I think this is gonna have to be our last question before we sign off. Um, I'm four weeks post-op and drink a green smoothie for breakfast, about two to three cups. When I try eating soft foods, I puke. I puke in water bottles, in napkins. What's going on? I go slow. Advice. I need to, Tara, to answer your question, I need to know if you've had a gastric bypass or a sleeve. And also, this is kind of getting into the realm of you're struggling a little bit. And, and I'm absolutely going to say you got to have a... Um, uh, a visit with your your bariatric surgeon to discuss this. So I'll just say, you know, if this is if you've had a gastric bypass, I'd be a little concerned right at four weeks out that you have a stricture and you should be talking to your doctor. We can go in endoscopically through your um, probably the most common complication I see in my practice. Somewhere around one out of twenty patients will need an endoscopy to dilate things up. Um, and it's really not a big deal, and it fixes the problem overnight. It's um, it's so certainly something that I think uh, um, you should you should be uh, willing to explore. If this is a sleeve, it's a little bit different question. This is something you got to talk to your surgeon about. Um, you know, depending on the severity of it, uh, whether you're dehydrated or protein mal malnourished, you need someone to really visit with you and sit down. I think either way, you gotta, you're gotta gonna have to talk to your bariatric surgeon about this. It's not normal to puke every day at any stage after the surgery. Now, granted, in the first week or so, sometimes people have some nausea and some struggles getting back to something more normal, but that is truly a, um, a minority. Um, the, the majority of, of patients really aren't vomiting so I'm seeing now Tara had a sleeve. Tara, you gotta talk to your surgeon about this. Um, it's not normal to puke like this. It's not. And um, and they should they should help you out and help you figure out what's going on here. Um, so C. Marie had a gastric sleeve a year and a half ago, lost 80 pounds, and I'm still nearly near 300 pounds. Is this weight loss in keeping with the sleeve? It's a little less than we'd expect, C. Marie. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, yeah, I think the pound of cure diet it depends on your best. You got to eat your best. This surgery works really well in some people and not so well in other people. And that the reason for that is not because the people who succeed are in any way, shape or form better or more compliant. Uh, it, it's primarily genetics that determines how someone does after the surgery. But we can't change our genetics and we can change our diet. So C. Marie, it's time to step it up and do everything you possibly can to get the rest of this weight off and get yourself, you know, I'd love to see you under 200 pounds. That seems to be kind of a landmark weight for so many women. Um, and 
I think getting on the Pound to Cure program, exercising really well, and maybe a little bit of weight loss medication, and you should be able to get there. So thank you very much, everybody. This has been a great session. I'm going to try to do these um, as often as I possibly can. Um, and uh, anyone in the Tucson area, feel free to check in for an appointment. I'll see patients at any stage in their weight loss journey. Um, take care.